This is the final lecture on metabolism for this microbiology class, and what we're going to cover is photosynthesis, food from the sun. Photosynthesis, some general concepts. It uses light energy to make ATP and NADH, as opposed to chemicals. The energy yields of ATP are limited only by the photons and efficiency of light capture. The process that creates this ATP is called photophosphorylation. It creates a proton gradient across the membrane, and that gradient is dissipated by ATP synthase. It's very similar to other membrane systems, as you'll see. Energy of electrons is boosted by the photosynthetic apparatus, and basically it takes photons, and it uses that to boost the energy of the electron into a higher orbital, and then that goes through the electron transport chain. The source of electrons can be inorganic or organic in microorganisms. The products of photosynthesis can include oxygen, sulfur, or sulfate. Most photosynthetics are capable of autotrophic growth. The major functions in phototrophs, there's two different parts of it. There's the light reactions, where the light harvesting pigments help to collect the light, and then that generates ATP, and also generates NADH, as you'll see. The dark reactions actually fix CO2 into cell carbon. Okay, here's the general scheme. You have light harvesting complexes. They then collect light in photopigments. These photopigments focus it on a special pair that focuses that energy on the reaction center. It boosts that electron, goes to the electron transport chain, quinones, blah, 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 and this pumps protons across the membrane. Basically, what we're talking about is the conversion of light energy to chemical energy. Photons come in, they boost that electron, and then an electron falls through the electron transport chain. Blue light has more energy and will boost the electron higher to a higher energy state than red light. Okay, let's look at a light harvesting complex. These are the complexes that supply photons to the reaction center. They're made of protein and pigments. The pigments will be chlorophyll or bacterial chlorophyll, bacteriophyophyton, which is basically chlorophyll without the magnesium, and then carotenoids. As you can see, these are highly ordered 2D arrays. Here is the light harvesting center that is arranged in Rotobacter spheroides. You have these light harvesting complexes that surround another set of light harvesting complexes, and in the center is the reaction center and all the light is focused and eventually in on the reaction center. The chlorophylls can collect different light waves. So if you look at chlorophyll, which is found in cyanobacteria, it will have a peak at about 680 nanometers and that's the light it collects. Bacterial chlorophylls will have different structures on them and because of that, in the case of bacterial chlorophyll A, it will actually collect light in the 800 to 1000 nanometer range. In them, you'll have two types of pigments, chlorophylls and carot carotenes. Chlorophylls and bacterial chlorophylls will absorb light at different wavelengths. I don't expect you to memorize these structures, but I would expect you to be able to recognize them. Here is chlorophyll A. It has a peak absorption of about 680 nanometers. Here is bacterial chlorophyll. Because of its different structure, it has slightly different absorption pattern, and it will absorb at around 800 to 1,000 nanometers. Photopigments of carotenes and xanthophylls are also found in reaction centers. These are long molecules with many double bonds. And here's a bunch of examples of different carotenes and xanthophylls, and these again are also found in photosynthetic organisms. They absorb light at different wavelengths, and most importantly, they're photoprotective for the photosynthetic apparatus. Here is one dihydroneurosporine that's present in a protein. This is how it looks in a protein. These provide protection from reactive byproducts. They're widely distributed. They have this common structure where you have a number of different double bonds. You can have cyclic rings at the end or not. And they're also important in light harvesting. First of all, it can quench the triplet state of chlorophyll. When you are exposed to light, when these chlorophylls are exposed to light, sometimes the electrons get overly excited and they will jump into orbitals and create this triplet state of chlorophyll. 
This is extremely reactive and it can pass this electron off to oxygen, forming singlet oxygen. And singlet oxygen is very damaging to the cell. It'll damage DNA, it'll damage protein, etc., etc. The cell wants to avoid that. Carotenoids are very good at quenching the triplet state of chlorophyll. So if it gets into that state, that energy can be transferred over to carotenoids and it goes back and forth on those double bonds. It resonates, it decreases it, and then the electron can be passed back to the chlorophyll once it's been reduced. And if you look at the special pair, which is shown here in a reaction complex, and you look at where the carotenoid is, its position just for this purpose, to be able to absorb that triplet state if it happens in either one of these chlorophylls. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about pigment position. Light harvesting pigments are orientated near the outside of the cell. And that allows them to collect light from the outside and focus those photons on the reaction center. And the reaction center is positioned to allow efficient transfer of light energy and the rapid transfer of electrons. Another thing to notice is the light energy travels down a downhill path to the reaction center. The outside light harvesting complexes absorb higher energy light that can be transferred to the inside light harvesting complexes and then that can be transferred to the right reaction center. The reaction center is where the light energy is focused. You have a whole bunch of different pigments. You have the special pairs, bacterial chlorophyll or chlorophyll. You have carotenoids, you have bacterial pheophyton, you have non-heme iron, and you have quinones. And what happens is light boosts this energy up. So what happens is you begin with a low energy electron that you get from your electron source. Light then boosts the energy of that electron. That electron can then travel down electron transport chain. So light increases the potential energy of the electron and makes it a good electron donor. Let's talk about electron flow. What happens is the light in the reaction center energizes that electron. It transfers down a few. It goes to a quinone. This quinone then goes into the quinone pool. It's released in the pool. It travels to a electron transport system. This then is donated to a number of different electron carriers, eventually back to a cytochrome, and then back to the reaction center. In the process of going through these electron carriers, protons will get pumped across the membrane. If you look at a reaction center, and here is the special pair, you can actually see its transport through different molecules. It goes from chlorophyll to bacterial pheophyton, right here in yellow, to an iron sulfur center, right here, to a quinone, and then this quinone is released out into the quinone pool. So the essential parts. You have a light harvesting complex, you have a source of electrons, that electron is transferred to the reaction center. The reaction center boosts the energy of that electron. It goes on to electron transport chain that creates a proton gradient. That proton gradient is then dissipated by ATP synthase that makes ATP. Finally, you have an exit pass for the electrons that results in the reduction of NAD to NADPH. And this is where they get their source of reducing power. So photosynthesis and these light harvesting react these, these light reactions can create both ATP and NADPH. There are several types of photosynthesis. Anoxygenic photosynthesis does not generate oxygen. It has many different sources of electrons, and there's a number of different groups of bacteria that do this: the purple bacteria, the green bacteria, and the heliobacteria, among others. Oxygenic photosynthesis generates oxygen, uses water as a source of electrons, and this is done by cyanobacteria. This is also the system that plants use. Okay, let's talk about these systems. First of all, there is the purple bacteria. They are found in freshwater and marine environments. They are gram-negative rods or spirilla, and they are members of the proteobacteria, the alpha, beta, or gamma proteobacteria. Their physiology, in their photosynthesis, they will use electron donors such as hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen, or even organic acids. They do not have to use inorganic sources of electrons. And they will oxidize sulfur or sulfate, and they obtain carbon from carbon monoxide, CO2, or organic acids. Here's an example of various blooms of purple bacteria 
where lake water is inoculated into a medium and just incubated under the light. You can see there's many different colors that come up. They're very interesting organisms. One thing that's really neat about the group of purple bacteria is they are facultatively photosynthetic. They don't have to grow photosynthetically and they can grow in a bunch of different modes. They can go grow photoautolithotrophically using car their carbon source of CO2, the electron source of hydrogen sulfide, light, and grow anaerobically. Uh, they can also grow using carbon monoxide as the carbon source. As a third mode of growth, they can use succinate as their carbon source and their source of electrons, but generate their energy from light. And this is photoheteroorganotrophically. And they can also grow chemoheteroorganotrophically on fructose under anaerobic and aerobic conditions. These organisms are incredibly versatile and they've been a great research model because their photosynthesis is not obligate. You can make mutations in the photosynthetic apparatus, the organism can still survive, and then you can investigate them. Their photosystem is housed in an intracytoplasmic membrane, as shown here, and this is a, actually in vaginations of the cellular membrane. And there are two light harvesting complexes. There's a peripheral complex and a core complex, and they focus the light energy onto the reaction center. The reaction center has a heavy medium and light chains. The medium and light chains contain carotenoids, bacterial chlorophylls, bacterial few phytons, uh, some tightly held quinones, and one freely dissociable quinone, and a non-heme iron. If you look at electron flow in these organisms, and here's the complexes, you can see that light comes in, it energizes the electron, it goes into a quinone, once that quinone is fully charged, it then transfers over to a light harvesting complex. And you'll notice the quinone donates the electrons and the protons, but the protons then are pumped across the membrane because the iron sulfur center won't take both. So you can see right here, the proton is released, the electron goes on here, and you end up pumping protons across the membrane. Okay, so that's how that system works. So that's the way they can generate a proton gradient and then ATP. The other thing they need is a source of reduced electrons. And what they do is something very interesting where they'll take an external electronic source, right? It gets onto the system, it's pumped in, and then they block being, having it be used for electron transport. And normally, quinones would not have enough electron potential to donate to NADP to make NADPH. But what the cell does is it stops transfer to this BC1 complex and the quinone pool then builds up so you have a lot of reduced quinone. And by changing the equilibrium, you can now push this reaction forward and donate electrons to NADP. And again, this is another example of the cell manipulating the equilibrium of a reaction, in this case, increasing the concentration of substrates so that it can make the product NADPH. So that's how they get their reduced electrons. Green bacteria. Green bacteria are gram-negative. They're obligate phototrophs. They use their light harvesting via a chlorosorm. Now, their phylogeny is that they are a distinct group and they're not related to other phototrophs. Here we're going to focus on one of these groups, which is chlorobiaceae, which are green sulfur bacteria. Here's some examples of different green sulfur bacteria, and they're called sulfur bacteria because they will make these globules of sulfur while they grow. Don't expect you to remember these. This is just for your entertainment. Okay, their physiology, they are strict anaerobes. They are obligate photoautolithotrophs. Their electron donors all can use H2S, some can use hydrogen gas or thiol sulfate as their source of electrons. Their big distinction in my mind is the formation of this chlorosome. And this is an elliptical structure that's just under the cytoplasmic membrane. Shown over here is a cytoplasmic membrane. This elliptical chlorosome is just underneath. Bacterial chlorophyll C is inside here and it's used for light collection but it's not associated with a protein. There's just this crystalline array of this bacterial chlorophyll, and it's exquisitely sensitive. These organisms are very good at collecting light under very low light conditions. That light energy is collected, it then goes to a base plate, and then goes through electron transport chain. 
you have this core polypeptide that's part of the lactic reaction center. You have here this light harvesting chlorosome, which will collect photons and then funnel them towards the reaction center. It then excites an electron on the special pair. It travels down through several different chlorophylls, ends up in a quinone, and then goes through a cyclic electron transport, which ends up pumping protons across the membrane. Here's the chlorosome, here's the reaction center, a cytochrome complex, and a cytochrome C554. So light comes in, it generates energy. Again, the electrons go through a series of electron carriers, end up in a quinone. The quinone then goes again to a similar pattern, a cytochrome BC1 complex, and in the process pumps protons across the membrane. So you can watch that cycle again. You can see the, the light come in, boost the electrons, boost more electrons, protons come onto the quinone, here, taken from the cytoplasm, get pumped across the membrane. An alternate pathway to generate their NADH, they will, these electrons can, instead of going to the quinone, go to an iron sulfur center, go through a few complexes, and end up on NAD, NAD to make NADH. In this case, the electrons are boosted to a high enough energy that you don't need to use any tricks. They'll just donate directly to NAD to form NADH. Finally, there are the cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria is ubiquitous in the environment. They're some of the most successful organisms on the planet. They're found everywhere, deserts to tropical forests, oceans, and even thermal hot springs. These over here are shown various cyanobacteria that were isolated from the desert. They're gram-negative, they're obligate phototrophs, and they do oxygenic photosynthesis. And this is a plant-like photosynthesis they form a tight phylogenetic group, so they're a single group of organisms. Their light harvesting complex involves phycobilisome proteins and a phycobilisome. Their photosynthetic machinery is in thycoloid membranes, and if you've learned about photosynthesis in plants, this should start to sound familiar. There's three different kinds of complexes. There's phycoerythrin, phycocyanin, and allophycocyanin. And the arrangement of the proteins allows that energy transfer. You'll have phycocyanin, for example, in this case on the outside, allophycocyanin on the inside. Again, high energy, light can then be transferred and eventually ends up in the reaction center. The reaction center is a combination of the purple and green apparatus. You have a photosystem 1 and a photosystem 2. Photosystem 1 has homology to the green reaction center. Photosystem 2 has homology to the purple reaction center. The chemistry is a little bit different and the protein numbers tend to be a little bit different, but clearly it seems like these are related. If we look at electron flow in this case, there's actually two systems. The first system will get its electrons from water, shown here, it will donate them to the quinone, and then that quinone goes through a complex, pumps protons across the membrane, and then donates them to photosystem one. Photosystem one is the cyclic photosystem. It can continue to be lit and go on. This can continue to go in circles and generate as big a proton gradient as you need. At some point when you've got enough ATP and you need reducing power, these electrons, instead of going to the quinone, can throw, go through a transport chain and eventually reduce NAD to NADH. Finally, in, at the end of this lecture, I want to talk a little bit about these different systems and what their homology means. First, photosynthesis probably evolved in a purple photosystem or green photosystem. And then one split off and a second photosystem evolved, either the purple or the green. So you had then these two organisms living separately. At some point, they got together and they started living in a symbiosis, the purple and green symbiosis, living again in communities. Eventually, there probably was a suffusion where both of these systems ended up in one organism and created the first cyanobacteria. So now you have the cyanobacteria living out in the environment doing these two things, and they pretty much spread all over the earth. Protozoans eat bacteria, and what probably happened at some point is a symbiosis happened between a protozoa and a cyanobacteria and made this endosymbiosis where the cyanobacteria began to live inside this protozoan 
creating a photosynthetic protozoan. This endosymbiotic cyanobacteria eventually evolved into the chloroplast. And now you've got a photosynthetic protozoan, and then after that, that evolves into a multicellular plant. So you can trace this series of events by looking at the homology of the proteins, and it absolutely supports this scenario. Before I finish this lecture, I want to talk about another different type of method of generating energy from light. Now, this is not photosynthesis. This is a different thing that's called retinol-based phototrophy. And it's a way to make AT from, from light, but not dependent on reaction centers or chlorophyll. This is first discovered in halophilic archaea. It requires only a single protein, bacterial rhodopsin. And the protein contains a light-sensitive pigment, retinal. Now, more recently, these bacterial rhodopsin-like proteins have been found in many other, different other microbes. Their role is not yet known. So what happens is light will hit this retinal and it will make it convert it from a trans to a cis moiety. And when that flips conformation, it causes the pumping of a proton across the membrane. It then relaxes back to this trans version and is ready to be hit by light again and pump again. These pump protons are then dissipated by ATP synthase and in the process synthesizing ATP. Just wanted to mention that now. We'll have more to say about that in other lectures. That is the end of this lecture on photosynthesis, and I will see you in future lectures. Have a good day.